but so that's what I try to do. I try to make sure that they understand that, hey, I've, I've PCS. I know what this is like. I had a family like this is this is not uncommon to me and and let them know that, look, I'm going to be your family's go to for whatever they need. So you can focus on what you got to do to get home safe and you don't have to have those phone calls, you know, about, you know, the frantic family member back here saying, hey, how do we pay the mortgage or oh, the insurance and trying to be, you know, that role as well. You're listening to the Real Estate Sessions podcast, and I'm your host, Bill Risser, Executive Vice President, Strategic Partnerships with Rate My Agent, a digital marketing platform designed to help great agents harness the power of verified reviews. For more information, head on over to ratemyagent.com. Listen in as I interview industry leaders and get their stories and journeys to the world of real estate. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 361 of the Real Estate Sessions podcast. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for telling a friend. Today, rather than a remote recording over the internet, I'm actually sitting down with my guest in the halls prior to day two of the Tom Ferry Summit in Dallas. On this episode, I'm thrilled to be talking to Rick Gonzalez of the Gonzalez Group, powered by Real Brokerage, LLC. Rick is up in the panhandle of Florida. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his military service and as an agent, how he continues to serve those in the military with their real estate needs. We're going to have a great time, so sit back, relax, enjoy, and let's get this thing started. Rick, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Bill. So, I owe you an apology. Uh, <laughs> we, met, we met via Inman, but also via the industry syndicate and podcasting and all that stuff, and, yeah. and to have you on as a guest this late is, is flat out embarrassing, so Just my saving apologies. the best for last is, you know, is what, <laughs> I, it's what, it's what I keep telling myself. Thanks for bailing me out. Thanks for bailing me out. Um, Look, you've listened to the podcast before. I have a very pretty pretty routine setup, with that, but I love to start at the beginning. And with you, I know you've been in Florida a long time. You, you, yeah. I see that you go back to early two thousands. You know, you were in Florida working, doing some things, and I know you served in the Navy. Thank you for that. Right. Um, but let's let's talk about the beginnings. Did you were you born and raised in Florida? Are you a native? No, no. Um, I graduated high school in in Florida, okay. but. My, I didn't get to Florida until 89, so it was, I was 15. Okay. And uh, I actually grew up, well, we'll go back further. I was born in Holland. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, my dad was Air Force, so stationed in Europe a lot. Okay. So he had met my mom in England, then he had gotten transferred, and so I was born in Holland, and we immediately went back to England after I was born. So I was raised in England until I was 15, so I had a, a really cool British accent when I moved here. Wow. So so your dad serves he had, there's an Air Force base that he worked at was he consulting? How yeah, that- no no no. There was multiple Air Force bases where we lived. It was Bentwaters Air Force Base in mm-hmm. Woodbridge, mm-hmm. Uh, which Woodbridge for the UFO nuts out there. Uh, there's lots of UFO activity in the Woodbridge area. Ah, okay. But uh but yeah, Rendlesham Forest if for for the UFO people out there look up that one, Rendlesham Forest. So I grew up off base because my mom was British. And uh, so I went to British school, wow. did the whole Harry Potter, the blazer and the tie, yeah. and the house, you know, yeah, the yeah. houses and schools, did all that. I was a prefect um, at one point. Wow. And, uh, and then my parents split and my dad moved back here to retire. And I stayed in England for a while with my mom and, until, uh, yeah, 88, my dad came back and, uh, and said, hey, you know, come to Florida. I, and, uh, I I can't believe I don't know that about you. One, well, there's not a lick of an accent. Yeah, it's completely and that's why, gone. That's why, right? No one, there's no accent, so people don't know to ask. Is your mom over still in, in English? Is she here no, in the States now? Everyone's passed. Oh, okay. uh, mom passed uh, a number of years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, But yeah, it was, uh, you can imagine coming to Northwest Florida, the South, yeah. with yes. a British accent. Yes. My first days of school... Uh, for the locals, if anyone locals listen, Choctaw High School, go Big Green. Um, <laughs> for the first days of school, there's that terrifying moment when the teacher's like, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, can you read the next paragraph? And you're sitting in the back, and as soon as you start talking, everybody in the entire classroom turns around and stares at you like, where did that come from? Right. And then I became the new kid from Australia. Oh, okay. For some reason, it was going to be Aussie, not not English. Nobody, nobody knew the <laughs> yeah. accent. Yeah. They assumed I was from Australia. That's awesome. Um, so some of the some of the girls loved it. The boyfriends, not so much. 
there was a few scuffles, and that definitely gave me some motivation to start to lose the accent as quickly as possible. Okay. So through some effort. My, my guess is you could whip it out whenever you want. Like No, you'd you be really, surprised. You, you really lost it, huh? Yeah, you'd be surprised okay. how, how quickly I lost it, and it stayed gone. Okay. Yeah. What part of England did you live in? The southeast, so it's okay. Suffolk. Yeah, um, yeah. There's down, down towards the channel. Felixstowe Port is yeah. is near us. It was a place called Ipswich. Okay. Oh, well, actually, it's right outside Ipswich, okay. Martlesham Heath. It's a big plan community. Wow. Yeah, it was really neat. Um, I enjoyed it, uh, living with all the British families and you know yeah. going to school. Yeah, it was I'm cool. sure they sort of adopted you, right? It was kind of like, yeah. Yeah, well, because my like said, my mom was British. She was a an. She was an ER nurse. Yeah, I didn't really have an American accent, okay. so it wasn't the only thing that that uh, kind of uh, tipped them off that I was not one of theirs was the flamboyant uh, American clothing of the the eighties. You know, the the big multicolored bubble jackets. <laughs> you were and, paying attention to what was happening over in the U.S. Yeah, well, because we would shop on base. Ah, you know, that's uh, awesome. we were you know one that's of awesome. only two kids in my school that had <laughs> access to the commissary. <laughs> I love that. That's cool. So you get to you get over to Florida. You you do high school, uh, and you you end up going into the Navy. So talk about that process. I mean, what what led you there? What was that like? Yeah, so you know, the the Dutch thing and the British thing come into play here. So on my 16th birthday, I actually was I got a letter from the Dutch consulate that I was going to be drafted into the Dutch Navy and which caught everybody off guard. Right. Didn't realize that just cuz I was born there they Is could it like do that. Perp- like automatic dual citizenship for you? Is that yeah. kind of it? Okay. So, so at some point I really had three, I was yeah. Dutch, uh, British and American. And so quickly we had to have a conversation like, well, what are we going to do? Well, we obviously we have to denounce the the Dutch citizenship because right. I'm not going right. to be exported back to Holland. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with the Dutch. <laughs> Nothing, no, no, no. For any of our Dutch no. listeners, yeah, exactly. you know, we yeah. love you guys. But, you know, the plan I think for me in my head with my dad being Air Force, you know, he was always this larger than life hero looking guy, right? He was always in uniform. He was yeah. my hero. So yeah. I always wanted to go into the military. Our neighbor in Florida was uh, an Air Force pilot. So I was groomed for the Air Force. Yeah. And then I don't know if you remember there was this little movie back in the mid eighties. Top Gun. No, you, you know, I lived in San Diego at the time. Yeah, okay. So you're familiar. <laughs> Very familiar. Um And so I had seen that uh, in the movie theater as a kid, and I was like, wow, those Navy pilots are pretty badass. Yeah, yeah, their motorcycles are awesome. (laughs) Yeah, right? They get all the chicks, you know. (laughs) And uh, so it was kind of perfect. Well, in high school, we had ROTC. And so, you know, it was Air Force ROTC. So I was already getting used to wearing the Air Force uniform. Mm -hmm. And then in walks the Marine recruiter, Staff Sergeant Williams. Mm -hmm. Never forget this guy. Yeah. And uh, and he asked everyone what they want to do. I said, I want to be a pilot and join the Air Force. He says, well, you know Marines are pilots too. And I said, no, I didn't know. And he was like, he says, yeah. He says, you know, we go through Navy flight school. He says, you know, they're the best of the best of the best. Mm-hmm. So I was hooked. So I started to, the process to join the Marine Corps, as a Marine Corps poolee in high school. We would go and train with the, you know, the staff sergeant on the weekends and everything. And then when I went to the recruiter's office, he was a little too thorough with his background check and found out I had asthma. Wow. And they disqualified me from the Marine Corps. Wow. So in Navy fashion, as I was leaving, very dejected from the recruiter's office, I hear, Psst, hey. Because <laughs> all these recruiter's offices are they're side, all right by there. side by side. Yeah. yeah so right. I'm walking out. <laughs> hey, you still want to go in the military? I was like, yeah. He's like, come here. And so two weeks later, I was off to the Navy. Wow. Where, where did you do your uh, training, your basic training? Orlando. Oh, okay. RTC Orlando. RTC right there. Yeah. yeah, we were one of the last classes through there in 94. Is that gone now? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, lot of closures for a lot of bases. Yeah, the, the only one they have now is up in Great Lakes, or Great Mistakes, as we call it. Ah, and also, San Diego still has one? Not a boot camp. Wow. Yeah, they used to have three, so it was, it was always like a, a roll in the dice to see which one you'd go to. And they tried to send me to to Great Lakes, and I was like, "Hey, look, I'm a Florida guy, and it's February. I'm not going to no." <laughs> yeah, and so I went to good. Orlando. Um, I I wanted to ask you a real quick sports question. You know, I ask a ton of sports questions. <laughs> not this I hear season, nothing. Though. I hear nothing in your <laughs> past about anything. You know, Yankees. Yet, how the hell do you become a Yankee fan growing up in England and living in Florida? 
What? And like everything else in my life is my dad. Oh, okay. You All know, right. so my dad, my, my dad's side of the family is from Puerto Rico okay. uh, via New York. So he gotcha. moved from Puerto Rico to New York when he was very little. Okay. Um, and my, my whole family lived up there before until he joined the Air Force. All right. Um, and went to, to Vietnam. He was a uh, huge Yankees fan. You know, big New York. Sometimes people say they hear it in my accent just a little bit, just from being around him so much. Yeah, and uh, and yeah. So it's. I, I would say the same thing. I would think I would think you might be from the Northeast. When yeah. you get going, you know, when we're, we're having a conversation, you kind of get rolling. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Somehow, I always have to get my guests. We have to leave this part. Like I could stay here for another hour. We right. Could, there's lots of questions like yeah. Gonzalez in in England. Yeah, that's different. There's probably not a lot of Gonzalez's. In no, Great Britain. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was weird growing up over there because in my whole school, it was like there was me and there was one black kid, and that was it. And so, but that's all I knew until I got over here. And then there's you know shorts and flip flops and girls, and it's a different life over here, Bill. Yeah, you're, you're okay with it. Yeah, I've, I've adapted. <laughs> I've especially the Emerald Coast. You're I've, okay I've with managed. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's. We got to get you in real estate. Where does that? What pops Ooh. up? What happens there that you go? You know, this is going to be the. This is going to be the way for me. So that's it's another long story. We um, got time. I uh, I never thought about being in real estate. I hated any idea of being in sales. So when I got out of the Navy, I was in Jacksonville, uh, and a good friend of mine, Rob Elotegi. Uh, it was our first summer in Jacksonville, and this was the time when uh, a little company called America Online was kind of getting started yep. uh, right there in the in the late 90s. And so for our first summer job, we went and interviewed at AOL for, I don't know, what customer service or something. Sure, sure. And I was going to pay like five bucks an hour uh, plus stocks. And, uh, and he says, man, this looks boring. Like, they're hiring bartenders over at Bennigan's. They make it like a hundred bucks a day and there's <laughs> girls everywhere. So, okay, cool. Let's go to Bennigan's. So of course, friends of ours that went to AOL are no longer working. They're yeah, all they owning their own islands. Or, <laughs> yeah. But, but so, you had Bennigan's. <laughs> but I had Bennigan's, which put me on the path of, I guess, the the soft skills of, of people and dealing with personalities, dealing with yeah. conflict. Um, and so that put me on this path of many, many years of restaurant work. And, uh, and then unfortunately, a few years later, Rob, uh, was killed when his helicopter was cra- uh, crashed off the, the coast and, uh, kind of put me in a little bit of a tailspin where it had been Rick and Rob for many years mm. and then he was gone. And so I wasn't really sure what I was going to do, but I kind of ended up joining a door to door sales cult. <laughs> All right, and uh, those soft skills get to be put to work. Yeah, now. A little so bit better. I left different? everything I owned. I just abandoned my my roommate and all of my belongings. Took my my sea bag full of clothes, and uh, we went to Boston with all of these guys. Everyone lived in the same house, and we went door to door in Boston selling. Uh, it was Verizon FiOS. Sure, and uh, yeah. and so I did that for two years. Boston, Knoxville, Tennessee. Atlanta and Jacksonville, and uh, and finally, I think I had purged enough um, and had enough of that life where I called my dad and I said, "Hey, I, I think I need to come home." So you're able to head back. Yeah, kind of- he well, he had to come pick me up because I had nothing but my clothes in the sea bag. Oh, okay. Um, so here I am in my God. This was, I think I was maybe 34 okay. at the time. Okay. And uh, and so I came back, was sleeping in his spare room. Went back to what I did in high school, which in the panhandle, a lot of things there are either military or they're vacation resorts. Mm -hmm. So I went right back to the company I used to work for in high school um, and got a job at the front desk at one of the resorts and uh, was moving up nicely into a salaried position when uh, the BP oil spill came along. And uh, so I was the last manager in, so first manager out. Yeah. So, Business dropped a little bit then when you couldn't go in the water. I'm well, and that was the thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. I was actually being a social media influencer early back then because I'm out on the beach taking pictures and sending them to guests like, hey, there's no oil here. That's way down the beach. Like, we're right. fine. Keep right. coming. And But it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah. So, uh, so BP gave me a check. And with that check, uh, I tried a couple of things. 
And when nothing worked, a friend of mine had suggested, hey, you got a pretty good personality. You might do good in real estate. Think about it. And so as a last ditch effort, I told the wife, I said, look, I'm going to try this real estate thing. And, uh, and yeah, that's how it worked. I used the money to get started. So Rick, I would imagine it's, there's an Air Force base up on, we're near you, right? Uh, we've got three. Three. Yeah, we okay. have uh, Herbert Field, we got Eglin Air Force Base, and Tyndall Air Force Base. Okay, so um, as an agent, uh, you, the, I think it's called PCS? Yep. Pretty you're right. good? Yep. What does that stand for? Permanent Change of Station. Perfect. And that that, that happens on on the regular for, for people especially who are uh, maybe going to do 20 years, get mm-hmm. their time in. So yeah. um, you're certified as a military relocation specialist? I am, but... Can we be honest on this podcast? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I don't put a whole lot of stock in that one. I took the class and I was very disappointed. Didn't it? It, it kind of was just like checking off some boxes to check off boxes, but not really helping, more or less. <laughs> yeah. So the the MRP is great for for anyone who has no military experience, yeah. but for whatever reason they want to, I'll say market to the military. Yeah. Because I don't feel it gives them enough education to help the military. So I'm a little critical of that one. Okay. I have it because I thought you kind of needed it. Sure. But uh, but I'm a little critical. Okay. Yeah. But you're, you've are you helped, I am going to guess, you've served right. many military families that have had to relocate in and out of Florida for, for whatever reason. Talk, yeah. talk about that a little bit, how important that is for you. Yeah. You know, so one of my things when I got into sales was I don't like sales. I don't want to do talk someone into something. Mm -hmm. I want to help people. And part of what we do is, is relating to the customer and the client. Mm -hmm. And so it's just easier for me to relate to a military person because we have some of the same experiences, been to some of the same places. We speak the same lingo. Uh, So I understand the stressors that are going in with PCS. So that has, has become my focus. So I would say probably 60% 60% or more of my business is uh, VA buyers and sellers, wow. PCSing in and out of the area, sure. um, and referrals. And, you know, it's it's not uncommon when a family PCSs that the military member deploys soon after they get there, which leaves a family behind yep. in a new area, not knowing people, kind of just fending for themselves. And that's a stressor for the family, but it's also a stressor for the military member who's deployed now. Yeah. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, I don't want the military member not focused on what they're supposed to do, worried about the family. Yeah. And I don't want the family worried about how, you know, where do we go for things. So I try to be that buffer. But so that's what I try to do. I try to make sure that they understand that, hey, I've I've PCS. I know what this is like. I had a family like this is this is not uncommon to me. Yeah. And and let them know that, look, I'm going to be your family's go to for whatever they need. So you can focus on what you got to do to get home safe. And you don't have to have those phone calls, you know, about, you know, the frantic family member back here saying, hey, how do we pay the mortgage or oh, the insurance and trying to be, you know, that role as well. So and it's it's been fulfilling you know, personally, where the reviews are great and, and I've built a lot of friendships with, with the client. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of long-term relationships. And these are people that are, that are going to be leaving the area. It's not like you're working this person who's going to, or working with a person who's going to be in the same area. However, I'm sure a lot of referrals have come your way. Yeah, you know, you get a lot of the same people. They transfer in from a lot of the same bases and then they usually transfer out to a lot of the same bases. So, yeah, there's lots. I mean, uh, one family that that I I served years ago, um, we still stay in touch now. They were a young married couple, like just recently married. I helped them buy their first house. Now they've got two kids. He's already out of the, the the Air Force, but we stay in touch all the time, and he constantly refers me business. That's great. And it's just, uh, yeah, like I said, and it doesn't make me feel like a, a salesperson, genuinely just trying to help people. Absolutely helping people. Yeah, that's great. In, in, in a time they need it the most. The uh, Emerald Coast. Let's talk about the Emerald Coast. So I, it, are you around the big curve, or are you part of the big curve first? That's my first question. No, we're we're around. You're around. Yeah, it. So you, you face due south. Your beaches face to the south. Yep. And Rick, I don't know if you know this, but there's hurricanes love you guys. 
Yeah, we have a big target. You, it's amazing. Area. Yeah. So I want to know, um, how do you handle that f- as an agent? I'm sure those conversations come up all the time. I would imagine you have some content out there, talks about stuff. I mean, I, you tell me how how do you handle that part of it? Because you, you'd be <laughs> surprised how how infrequently that conversation actually comes up. Wow. Okay. I do have, you know, I did do the whole hurricane prep. Uh, blog on the website, and and I did I, I have some information you know at the ready, yeah. Um, and of course I mention it. Um, you know we have the discussion, but um, you know in Florida we're we're kind of silly when it comes to hurricanes. Like the last one I think that came through our area was a category three when I went to bed, and we were fine. And I was like, yeah, it's only a three. Yeah, it's only a three. We woke up and it was a five. And I was like, <laughs> oh, maybe we should have left. But, you know, we were fine. So it's almost like, you know, on the West Coast, you know, with the the earthquakes, it's like you experience so many that you kind of become a little numb to it. Yep. And, uh, and knock on wood, our little area in the Panhandle has been pretty lucky. Like, like a few years ago, Mexico Beach obviously yeah, got devastated. Yeah, that was Michael, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was the one where I went to bed and I woke up and it was a five. And yeah. I was like, well, should have left. Yeah. But I don't know. There's we've just gotten very lucky in my area. Michael was just a few miles east. Um, That's so, all it takes. Yeah, especially to be on the dirty side or whatever it takes. I mean, there's all kinds of different. Yeah, Tampa, St. Pete, we're the same way. Yeah, everything just wiggles a little bit in the last day. Right. It's gonna one day. It's not gonna wiggle. Yeah, well, you know, we get a little bit of a heads up, but nobody wants to leave that early in case it doesn't come. Yeah. And then everyone gets on the road last minute and you're stuck on the road. When I was in Jacksonville, uh, when I lived in Jacksonville, the first hurricane I went through over there, I decided to leave and I had a soft top Jeep oh. and I got stuck on 95 in my Jeep. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. I went back yeah, to the dorms. If, it, if you don't go in the with four or five days uh, like leeway, yeah. if you're there the day before, you're stuck. Just yeah, All the hotels down, are booked. Down. Everything is, it's, yeah. you, where do you go? Yeah, but you yeah, don't, no, you don't go anywhere. We cover the prep part of it because I think that's important, you know, um, how to protect the house, make sure you've got supplies. We yeah. cover the basics. Yeah. But and you probably know, get calls or questions if, if things and, are happening. You know, and let's be let's be serious, Bill. I mean, they, these guys are you know military, like they're trained for a lot more than than hurricanes. So yeah. when it comes to emergency prep, they're they're plenty you know qualified to to Do handle a lot that, so. of that kind of training yeah. in the military. Yeah, good. Let's talk a little bit more about your your actual um, your career. You you were with EXP for a few years. This is a yeah you like 2017 or 18. You kind of went. To EXP, and I understand that that move because uh, a lot of agents were doing that at that time. But then you've also now um, made a change. You just a year or two ago, you decided to go with Real. Let's talk about that transition. Yeah. So EXP was definitely not my first brokerage. I was at no, you four had, or five before. Yeah, you that. were kind of worked your way up. Right. I'm a yeah. mover. Okay. If it doesn't feel right, I move. Okay. So I've done the the big box, the KW, the Remax. I've done I've done the small boutiques. I've done the hundred uh, percent brokerages like World Impact. So EXP for me at the time was uh, was kind of perfect. I hated going to the office for yeah. the meetings. So the cloud brokerage thing uh, was great. And and I'll be honest, what really sold me on EXP at the beginning uh, was you know our friend Shannon Milligan. Yeah, she had just joined, and the team I had previously uh, was had left. They were using Commission Zinc as their CRM. Okay, and at the time, EXP was offering that for that's free. Right. That's right. So I said, "Wait a minute, I get that for free? Like that's a twenty five hundred dollar? No, that's yeah." And so I didn't know anything about the revenue share or the style. Okay. I I just knew Shannon was going, and I like Shannon, and I knew I got this great CRM for free. So I joined. And loved it for the first two years, and then it became very recruiter heavy. And just, mm. I, I'm involved at my association level on the board and on committees, and right. and I found myself getting. Uh, I was like, "Hey, how are you doing?" You know, uh, I'm Rick with EXP, and they would kind of look me up and down like, "Oh, you're one of those." I was Ooh. like, "I'm sorry, excuse me." Um, and uh, and so it soured a little bit. Sure. And then, kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, I had met uh, our friend uh, Tim Macy at EXP. He was a, a mover and a shaker at EXP. And one day, so at this point, I'm at EXP for four years. My business was doing okay. 
I still wasn't a fan of some of the antics happening there, but sure. it was the best thing that I knew about at the time. So I wasn't planning on going anywhere. And then I saw a post on Facebook that Tim Macy had just moved his team from EXP to Real Broker. I was what the hell is that? Yeah. I never heard of this. So I yeah. called Tim and he explained everything to me and I said, well, okay, that sounds like an even better deal. And by better deal, it just it was a, a fresh start. Yeah. Uh, EXP had blown up and Real was at the beginning. Yeah. And, uh, and then the numbers made a little bit more sense too. When I put in my business, I made just a little bit more. So I was like, okay, well, there's nothing, there's no downside here. Right. And so I threw all my trust in Tim as I did before with Shannon and uh, called a few of my guys said, hey, I know you just joined EXP, but <laughs> we're, we're leaving. Uh, if you want to come <laughs> with, you can. Uh, and I'd say half came, half, okay. half went elsewhere. Now I've been at Real for three years. Yeah, it's it's been fun to watch the development, the growth. I mean, it's Real feels like um, it, it's looked at what EXP's done right. and that model that Glenn developed, which really was fantastic, right? To get away from profit sharing because profit could be manipulated right. to true revenue sharing, but somehow figuring that out because you do, you can't be you got to make sure it's going to continue and work. Yeah. You can see where people could start gaming the system and and try to you know, pull out, pull some crazy stunts, but I think they've done a good job of c catching that and fixing yeah. that. I think then for, for, for Tamir and for now Sh Sharon, yeah. right, they, they are, they're doing some great things at real to do the same thing, to kind of keep, keep everything in place and make sure that it's a, a scalable, growable company. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's when I first came over the, the big word that was thrown around, uh, the emphasis of everything that they were trying to build was the culture. Mm, and it was yeah. trying to bring the right people, put the right people in the right seats and continue to, to kind of nurture that same culture and yeah. bring in the people that believed in that same thing. Um, and, you know, you're always going to have a few bad actors that squeeze through, but, you know, that kind of works itself out uh, in the wash. But uh, I'd say for the most part, uh, I still feel like the culture here is is unmatched. Um, it's it's really crazy. I just spent last week, as you know, down at Florida Realtors where we saw each other. Yeah. And there's all the Florida agents there. That's my state, right? There's, there's all, and I come here to Texas to a Tom Ferry Summit, and there's all my real people here. And I feel so much more at home with these guys than, yeah. than some of these other agents. You know, they're just, yeah. they're my people, you know? Yeah, that's it's, great. Yeah, the culture here really is crazy. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about podcasting before we wrap this yeah. up. You had the modern agent mm -hmm. that's about, you know, and I was, I had the real estate sessions going. Um, there were some big plans, that, you know, like big plans happen sometimes. Right, it doesn't work out, but, but um, you you let yours kind of fade away. Yeah, because and I think we talked about it. There was you know, the reason was um, you weren't very passionate about it. Is that kind of well? It, it was the the workload when you're doing it by yourself. Is, is and a you're lot. a full time realtor. Yeah, it's you know, a lot of work. And, and a husband and a dad. And, yes, you know. So yeah. it's trying to find a guest every week, or or do everything the recording, the editing. The, the so it, it was it was a lot of work, and um and I did enjoy it. And every time I got someone that reached out and said, "Hey man, I love your podcast. Learn something." It it kind of you know I wanted to keep going. I just didn't have it in me to to do it to the level that I thought it should be. So you decided. And I don't know if we can talk about this. If no, you can't yeah. talk about this, we, we can. <laughs> right. We can talk but about it. It's the, not yeah, you, you're you're in the middle of um, getting ready to launch something new and different that yeah. divides up the workload. Yeah, we're excited about it. So I'm sure people who listen to your podcast podcast may also listen to to Smartless. Yeah. Um, I didn't know of Smartless the podcast, but I watched the the special where they did their tour. And I thought the uh, the setup they had was absolutely fantastic. Three hosts, mystery guests, just off the cuff, and and I said, man, how cool would it be to do a real estate version of this? And so I uh, I reached out to some some fellow agents. I I purposely wanted agents in different parts of the country, so we would have access to to different people, different yeah. demographics. Yep. Um, and yeah, so we've we've got uh, two other hosts. Um, we've recorded, I think six episodes so far. Nice. We're going to wait and, uh, to launch until we have at least 10 in the can and then we'll launch it. So we're hoping for when real has their, uh, their event in October, our rise event, hoping to have it all buttoned up and ready to release that rise. Awesome. So it's not released yet, but the name of the podcast is going to be real random. Ah, I like I was, it. 
trying to come up with a way to play off of the smart list idea, but we couldn't come up with it. And so yeah. uh, through a little chat GPT and a little uh, brainstorming, real random. So every week, different uh, guests that two of the, the hosts won't know about. Runs about an hour on average, uh, and it's just us digging into, similar to what you do, digging into a little bit more than the tactics of real estate, more of the, yeah. the person behind it. Yeah. Um, There's some really and, cool people in this industry. It's great to get the stories. Really, we had <laughs> our, our, the first few of ours, I was amazed because it seems like everyone we're interviewing is like a closet uh, musician and in oh, a band or something. Yeah. I'm like, what, There's- really? Yeah, there's some great stories. Dungeons and Dragons geeks, and it's like, <laughs> wow, you just don't see it in the polished real estate side. So it's kind of cool. Rick, you know the drill with me. I, I've asked the same question to every guest for the last uh, eight years. Uh, I'm going to throw it your way. What one piece of advice would you give a new agent just getting started in the business? The Well, I just gave this piece of advice too. I think the best thing you can do if you're a new agent in the business is get out of your local bubble. Mm. Um, I think sometimes when you're too focused on your team, your office, your association, um, you're restricted on what you're learning. And for me, the big learning curve started hitting once I started coming to events like this, traveling, meeting people outside the state, pe- meeting people from different brokerages, because those people don't see you as competition. And if you meet the right ones, they're very willing to pour into you yeah. and give you all of the tips and tricks that work. Whereas your local guy, he sees you at comp- as competition. He's not gonna. He's not gonna do it. So, I would say just as soon as you possibly can, start planning and saving for a convention in Inman or a Tom Ferry or something. Get out of your bubble. Get to a big convention and uh, do some some networking with some people outside of your area. I love that. I think that's the first time that has been. Oh yeah, I think about that. Three hundred and sixty one episodes. You're the first There's a reason you saved me for last, Bill. <laughs> I knew you could come up with something. <laughs> Rick, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, I would say the best way is uh Instagram, yeah. uh Rick dot A dot Gonzalez and that's Gonzalez with a Z. So G O N Z A L E Z. Um so just reach out on Instagram. Uh yeah, DM me awesome. there. Rick, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we're, we're in day two of, of the Tom Ferry Summit. I'm My first yeah. one. I'm really excited to see what's going to so happen stoked. today. So Lots of AI coming today. Lots of, I know. It'll be great. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks, Bill. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Sessions. Please head over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash RE Sessions to leave a review or a rating and subscribe to the Real Estate Sessions podcast at your favorite podcast listening app. Hey.